good to see each of you here this morning and look forward to this first hour of worship together. May the Lord be pleased to meet with us and Christ be glorified. Let's take our chorus books and toward the back you'll see the hymn complete in thee, no work of mine. This is truly the testimony of those that the Lord has taught by his grace. Complete in thee, no work of mine, may take, dear Lord, the place of thine. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and I am now complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh, blessed God, and sanctified, salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Complete in thee, no more shall sin. Thy grace hath conquered, reign within. Thy voice shall bid the tempter flee. And I shall stand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh, blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Complete in thee, each wants supply, and no good thing to be denied. Since thou my portion, Lord, will be, I ask no more complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh, blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Dear Savior, when before thy bar all tribes and tongues assembled are, among thy chosen may I be, at thy right hand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh, blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Let's have a word of prayer together. Gracious Father, I thank you for this opportunity to meet together once again for worship. How we need these times apart from the hustle and bustle of this life and this world and truly make this an oasis for us where we can drink of the water of life and feed upon Christ the bread of life and be nurtured and strengthened, built up from your word as we hear it, as we go back out into the world, knowing that if you have been pleased to choose us and redeem us and justify us in the death of your son, we are indeed blessed. And then to have your presence with us by your spirit, that we're not wandering this world as orphans, but having the entire Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, as our hope and being complete in Christ. What a blessing. So I pray that you would remove from us the cares of this life, those that would easily spring up and choke out the word and truly strengthen us, I pray, in what we're about to hear. We're mindful to give you all the praise and honor and glory in our dear Savior's name. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and look together in Proverbs chapter 27. And I put in the bulletin, the text is from verse 8 down to verse 
22, just because it's all connected. And I've entitled this Wise and True Sayings. So I'm going to read the text that's here, and then as we go down through it, we'll see how the Lord directs as to how far we get. But as we're reading, may we be mindful that this is God's inspired word, and that every word of this scripture is inspired of God. God breathed. May we not ever open this word and just read it as any other book, but to understand that what's written here is for our learning. And as Paul wrote to Timothy, that it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, mm -hmm. not our own. What we read here as we consider who we are as fallen sinners, we are made to see that unless Christ is that righteousness, unless Christ is that surety, we would certainly be destroyed. And so the words here recorded, the wise and true sayings, think about the words of Christ. He's this wisdom that is set forth here. And there's a lot of hidden meaning in what we're reading that the natural mind can't perceive. They can read Proverbs. And they can spin them and try to understand them in a natural sense. But unless we see Christ in every scripture, then we're nothing more than blind men feeling about, attempting to discern the meaning without understanding. Because only in Christ does any of this have its meaning. True wisdom is Christ. And yet... Men in their natural minds will find many of these, even as the disciples said, these are hard sayings. Well, they're hard if we're left to our own thoughts. But as the Spirit teaches us, we're brought to bow and to glorify Christ in everything in this word. That's why this word was written and inspired and is kept for our learning today. Even as in, we've seen in, in the Proverbs chapter 8 that wisdom is better than rubies. And all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. What is that wisdom other than Christ himself? I pray that as we read this, and I'm going to read the entire portion so that we can see the context here. These are not just disjointed sayings but I've mentioned this before. Each of these is like a pearl on a chain that you put on there. And the whole together represents the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ and adorns his doctrine and what he declares of himself here in this word. So we begin in verse 8 of Proverbs 27. As a bird that wandereth from her nest so is a man that wandereth from his place. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. Neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. My son... Be wise and make my heart glad that I may answer him that reproacheth me. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Take his garment that is surety for a stranger and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. He that blesseth his friend with a loud voice rising early in the morning it shall be counted a curse to him. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Whosoever hideth her hideth the wind and the ointment of his right hand, which bereath itself. Iron sharpeth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. 
Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. So he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. As in water, face answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of a man are never satisfied. As the finding pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. Though thou shouldst bray the fool in a mortar among wheat with a pestle, yet will not his foolishness depart from him. So as you can see here, the wisdom of the Lord, first of all, in reminding us who we are. Whenever you read in here about one who is a stranger or one that is a strange woman or a continual dropping of a rainy day, even so a contentious woman, don't think of somebody else, but this is the word describing who we are by nature. And why it is that more than ever, we need the grace of, of God. We need the Lord Jesus Christ as that faithful friend, that one who is closer than a brother, as we saw in verse six early on. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You can see that as being a friend speaking truth to who we are. And even though it wounds, yet it's for our good. But as we saw last time, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds that Christ, our friend, endured. He endured the contradiction of sinners against himself. Just like here in verse 13, when it speaks of taking a garment that is a surety for a stranger. It's warning us not to be that surety for a stranger, that if you take that garment thinking that somehow that stranger now is going to pay you back as if it were a loan, well, be careful. Be careful, especially in taking a pledge of one who is a strange woman. This is talking about basically a prostitute and she's in need. And so you take that garment, you take a pledge. What that means is that you expect them to come back and recover that pledge. Well, the warning is not likely to happen. So don't enter into any kind of relationship as a surety for any other sinner without considering what that means. Well, you consider what our Lord Jesus Christ did in being the surety of sinners. And I know some would look at that and think, well, that was a risk. Him coming into this world and, and taking on him their sin. In essence, it's a beautiful picture. This is why I say these are wise sayings. There's a lot of hidden wisdom in this because in essence, he took our garment which is nothing but filthy rags and cannot stand and help us in our day. And what did he give us in the place? His garment. We're clothed in his righteousness that he came and earned and established to God's satisfaction. And so as we read through these, it begins to open up like a flower. And that's why I don't want to rush through it. We can always change what's in the bulletin. We're not servant to this number of scriptures here. It's just as I was preparing, it's the whole portion here is so vital for our understanding. And in it are those wise and true sayings that pertain to the Lord Jesus Christ. I still consider how when our Lord spoke, no man could answer to his wisdom. And even when the scribes and Pharisees, Sadducees sent their people to go bring the Lord Jesus Christ, in essence, to arrest him. This was well before he was taken before Pilate. They came back empty handed. And when they were asked, well, where is he? Why didn't you bring him? They said, never a man spoke as this man. And when you consider too that the Lord Jesus Christ came to fulfill all that was written of him in the scriptures, that's what we're reading right now how he is that very wisdom of God 
in the flesh personified and how we need to hear his word. But unless he gives us his spirit, everything we read here is going to pass just as it's described, Proverbs. And leaving us puzzled as to the true meaning. If you ever wonder about the true interpretation of any scripture, I don't care where you find it, these two things are true. One is always going to abase man and bring us low because we have nothing that can commend us to God. But secondly, it's always going to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you can keep that in mind, as we read these scriptures, the Lord by his spirit then opens up that word to us. But that's really the two ways of reading the scripture, how it abases us as sinners, but how it exalts the Lord Jesus Christ as God's righteousness and holiness and wisdom before him. So even beginning with verse eight, you'll see how this unfolds when it talks about a bird that wanders from her nest. Well, this is talking about a little bird that begins to develop its wings. And I don't know how animals think or birds ponder. They got little, they got brains, they got little minds, and it's, it's as the Lord directs. But imagine a little bird then that determines somehow that it's able to fly on its own and go out there and, and wanders. And yet in so doing, leaving that nest, and going out on its own, it exposes that little bird to all kinds of dangers. Hunters, they call them fowlers, because their idea is to snatch these birds and either eat them or sell them in the marketplace. And so there's a danger when that bird leaves its nest. It says, so is a man that wandered from his place. Now, there's a lot that could be said even there in terms of God's providence, being dissatisfied even with where the Lord has put us and determining that somehow I'm gonna set out on my own. I'm going to determine my way and that not considering what is the will of the Lord. Well, I know this, we can never get out of his will. I grew up on that kind of teaching that You've got to find the center of God's will. If you ever got get off center, then somehow things will start going awry. You can't get out of God's will. He determines all things. Scripture says, even our wanderings, are they not written in his book? What he's determined and he's purposed. We learn from them. And if we're the Lord's, by his grace, Christ is that great shepherd, because that's what sheep do, right? They wander. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. But he graciously has his eye on his sheep and he never abandons them. They may wander, but he has his eye on them and his rod and his staff, they comfort him. In other words, he uses that correction to bring the sheep back to himself. But what is described here in verse eight is that's our nature. Just like a bird that wanders from her nest, so is a man that wanders from his place. Think about how we are in Christ and to think in any way that somehow by looking out into this world or following after some other new thing that we can be better for it. We can't. How we need the Lord to keep us in our place. So is a man that wandereth from his place. That's why as the Lord teaches us, we rest in that work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his justification, the justification of sinners by his work of the cross. That's our place. And for us to ever think that somehow there's something more like acquaintances that we have. They're always pursuing something more. They're not settled in the one place where God 
his purpose, the salvation of his people. And they continue to look for some new thing, some new experience. And they want you to follow after them. How we need the grace of God to remain where he has put us and not be tempted away in thinking that somehow out there there's some better thing. And so the warning is clear that yes, it's our nature to wander just like the bird wandering from her nest. I love how the scriptures use illustrations. I've watched birds sometimes where you've got this one lone bird out there just flying around facing the wind. You wonder where is that bird going? Well, that would be us left to ourselves, but thankfully the Lord never leaves us to ourselves. There are these, those moments of folly because of this flesh where we assume that a better place would be over here, over there. And yet, even in life, as it is spiritually, we cannot be in any better place than we are. That's that nest that God has provided for us, which is for our nurturing, it's for our protection, and that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the exhortation here is be content, be thankful for where the Lord has put us. The classic example might be that here the Lord has given us a place, a nest, even in this meeting place. It's not much to look at. There's a bunch of people that drive by here and look at the building. I've had some tell me, oh, that's a church. That's what they call a church. I thought it was a business because it doesn't resemble anything like what men or women perceive in the world as being a congregation where we meet to hear of Christ. And we've had some that have come and sat here for a while and heard the message of Christ, but after a while get discontented, thinking that there's a lot more people over there than are meeting here. I think I'll go over there and just try and see. Maybe it's not as bad as what I think. And maybe even though they don't preach Christ as plainly as here, maybe I can still benefit somewhere else. Well, that's that bird that wanders from its nest. And unless they are the Lord's and he lets them fly away, they fly to their own destruction because there's no other place that we can find rest and comfort than that place where we can hear of Christ, that place where in his word, even here, we fly not from this word, but we continue to look to this word for our nurturing and our teaching because it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see, that's a wise saying. My dad always used to say, one word of the wise is sufficient. Because <laughs> he would say something and I would think better. He'd say, son, a word of the wise is sufficient. And so it is here. We need no other word. We need no other comfort than what we find in the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is, what he's accomplished for sinners. You're not going to find anything out there wandering from this place who Christ is. What is it that you are looking for? Is it forgiveness? Well, there's no forgiveness apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. How about peace? People talk about peace. He is our peace. Reconciliation with God. You're not going to find any other place where you can find reconciliation other than in the Lord Jesus Christ. How about justification? Being justified means to be acquitted from all guilt. And most people wander away because they've got guilt. They sense that guilt, and so they're constantly looking for some help, some relief. Well, the problem is they're following their feelings. They're following their emotions. They're following people, especially when some come up alongside and say, well, I can help you. Let's have a word of prayer. And so you confide in their prayers, so-called. Well, there's no place of comfort or peace there to be justified before a holy God. You'll have no justification other than in, by, and through the Lord Jesus Christ, that work that he came and established, and God the Father has already accepted. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that I'm dealing with a God who has been satisfied. 
He doesn't need me up working and wandering and attempting to please him. No, he's satisfied with his son and that work accomplished there at the cross. So we rest. When the storm comes and you're that bird in that nest, don't think that somehow you're going to find safety just by diving out of the nest and facing the storm. No, the rest is in that nest. That rest that we have is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now having the key, see, that's what we're looking at here. How do we understand these Proverbs? Well, look at verse 9. Christ condemned the Pharisees, saying to them, you've taken away the key. There's one key that opens up every scripture, every one. What's that key? Or who is that key? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you read here in verse 9, ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. We could spend an entire message right here on verse 9. And how it depicts the Lord Jesus Christ as that ointment and that perfume, the savor of his person, the savor of his death and what he's accomplished, the savor of his sacrifice that is a sweet savor unto God the Father. And if unto God the Father, on our behalf, for us as well. When someone puts on ointment and perfume, and the, the smell of it is a sweet smell, you consider just how it affects your heart and your outlook and everything. Here it says rejoices the heart. I think about the tabernacle in the Old Testament and the temple, that there was that altar of incense. You ever think about that? That was gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and other things that were represented there as to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the high priest or the priest that served the high priest would go into that inner sanctuary, the entire temple, the entire sanctuary was filled with that perfume, that ointment. And it was to be done exactly as the Lord ordered. This was not trying different perfumes or ointments to see if someone liked the smell better than what was ordained of God. Remember Aaron's sons were killed because they offered unto God strange fire. And it had to do with the carrying in of this incense into that inner sanctuary at a time when God hadn't ordained and with their own mixture, thinking that they would be creative as to how they would present this before the Lord. We're not to do that. The ointment and perfume, just as when you read in the Song of Solomon, that's how Solomon's bride knew that this king that had drawn her in his love was who he was by that ointment, by that perfume, by that sense which caused her to be drawn to him and caused her heart to rejoice. Can you not see how this is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ? And I would encourage you to go through the scriptures and consider the different places where ointment and perfume are mentioned, even as I said, with regard to that temple, with regard to that tabernacle, and the sweet savor of the graces of the Lord Jesus Christ and what it represents in all things. But here, in addition, it says, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. This is more than just experiencing, like people like to talk about experiencing God and experiencing Christ. The ointment and perfume have to do with his person and the glories of who he is. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. You stop and think about even in human terms, if you've got a good friend, that in time of despondency or hardship or trouble, that friend comes along and speaks words of comfort and counsel to you in life. Who is more precious than that friend 
Well, here we have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Again, it goes back up to that faithful friend mentioned up there in verse six, in contrast to the kisses of an enemy that are deceitful. We don't want just anybody's word. We need a word from the Lord. And even as Christ is represented here by that ointment and perfume that rejoice the heart, so the sweetness of a man's friend, I read there the sweetness of that friend of friends, the sweetness of him who is that faithful friend, a sinner such as we are. But notice, by hearty counsel. What that means is it's not just his person, but it's his word. It's the instruction that we receive from his word. Isn't that why we come together? I don't want to be just up here flapping my jaws, giving you some practical advice for everyday living. Like you can find that anywhere. There are a dime a dozen. And that's what many people, because they don't know Christ, they feel like they've been a, into a therapy session when they, come to their places of worship. And oh my, did, did the preacher ever give us some pointers on life and how to live it today? But that's not lasting. That's just like taking a drug for a while. It makes you feel better, but afterward the effects go away. In the end, you're left with nothing. What about the sweetness of Christ <laughs> and the hearty counsel that we have in studying his word you're holding in your hand a, a library of Christ's word. And no matter where you turn and point the finger, it has to do with Christ. It has to do with him in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge dwell. And that's why I never encourage somebody just to read through the Bible in the ear. Try to read as much as you can. That's too fast. It's like in preaching through the scriptures. We can smooth over this and just rush through it and say, well, we heard the word today. But to do so would, would be to keep us from the depths of what is here revealed, that hearty counsel. I like the word hearty. It's not just for our head. It's for the heart. To be received as the Spirit teaches us of Christ. And long after, we separate here and go our ways. That word continues to work. And so when anybody asks you, well, what did you hear today? Well, I heard a word from the Lord. That's my prayer. And what a word it is, because it's about him who is the word. And he is the wise counselor. We're deceived when we follow after men, but we can never be deceived by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so, moving to verse 10, it says there, thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not, neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. And so, again, when we consider who is Christ and who is this friend, well, that's who he is. And notice, thy father's friend. If we're the Lord's, then we have the same father as Christ himself. This is that union that there is between the sinner that Christ has come to redeem and Christ and his father. All that Christ is for us, he is to his father. And that's what Christ prayed in the garden there in John 17, that he we might have the, the same glory that Christ had with his father even before he came into this world. And so how we need him when it says forsake not, don't think that other men's counsel is gonna profit you more than who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished on your behalf. Here he says, neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity. There has to do with, and this is where the rubber meets the road, because if this gospel, if this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ does not stand for us in the day of calamity, then nothing will. But how many times 
in the calm will sit and say amen to Christ being all. And yet in the day of calamity, what do we do? We go seeking advice from others. I think I'll go ask my brother in the day of calamity what he would do in this situation. There we're warned that it's better not to forsake our true friend, that is the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father's friend. That's who Christ is to the Father. He's everything. Forsake not, particularly in the day of calamity. And here when it speaks of going into thy brother's house, it's talking about flesh and bone brother. One who is, is flesh and bone, you begin to seek their advice and counsel in that day of calamity. And especially one that has no understanding or knowledge of Christ and who he is. Better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. Well, who is the neighbor that is near? See, all of this relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's that one who is that neighbor, and he's near. He's at hand and ever ready and willing to give us the help that we need in time of need. That's why the writer of the Hebrews wrote of that in Hebrews chapter 4, that He's that high priest, and he is not one who has not been made acquainted with grief. He was tempted in all things, yet like we are, yet without sin. And so let us come boldly, it says there in Hebrews 4, under the throne of grace where we might find grace to help in time of need. He's ever near. He's ever present with us. And so in calamity, who is it that ordains calamity? It's the Lord. That's why the writer there in Ecclesiastes declared, in the day of prosperity, rejoice. And the Lord gives us so many times of prosperity, but all these things come from his hand. But it also says in the day of adversity, consider, because God has put one against the other, lest man should find out anything after him. If we could somehow look forward to have some kind of foreknowledge of what is to come, one of two things, if we don't like what we see, we'd be in a panic. We'd be like that bird leaving the nest. I got to get out of here. When it's the Lord that has ordained those days, or we might become somehow self-presumptuous and thinking, oh, I look down, oh boy, it's going to be a good week today. That's what people want when they read horoscopes. They want something good to look forward to. But the Lord doesn't reveal these things. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And we know as God's children, part of being in this life, in this flesh, in this depraved fallen world, I marvel that we don't have more bad days than we do. And how merciful the Lord is in keeping us from what could be. But the whole point here is better is that neighbor that is near. Christ is ever near to his sheep. Sometimes we might lose sight of him, but he never lose sight of us. And Christ said that, my sheep hear my voice. He says, I know them and they follow me. When he says he knows us, he knows us. Inside out, he knows our every weakness. He, he knows our infirmities. He knows everything about us, but never abandons. That's unlike so many that are brothers who are far off. They don't have anything to do with you in your everyday life, but suddenly now in your calamity, you reach out to them. Well, they're not going to be of any help to you. You already have that friend in the Lord Jesus Christ, that neighbor, See, again, I'm just touching the surface here, but consider what the scriptures have to say about Christ being that friend, Christ being that neighbor, Christ being that ointment that rejoices the heart, that, that counsel that we have of him. You see, these are the little wise sayings like pearls that are strung together. And now we begin to see the beauty of every one of these particular problems. 
And then we'll look at verse 11 here and have to stop for today. My son, be wise and make my heart glad that I may answer him that reproacheth me. Now you could read this in a natural sense of a father to a son and giving them instruction. I'm thankful for the instruction I received of, of my father. There are many days, although he's been passed for a number of years, I still hear different words in my mind, recall of what he had to say to me for my good. At the time, it didn't seem that important, but now, as I get older and have had children, I consider the same thing, that anything I can say for my children, that it be for their good and make my heart glad, be wise. But if that's all we see here, again, it's practical, but that's missing really who this is about. Think of God the Father speaking of his son. And you say, well, why would you have to say to him, be wise? Well, as the shirt, as the representative of his people, you talk about the wisdom that was required for Christ to come in the flesh. And the writer of the Hebrews says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. He had to prove or by his life satisfy every jot and tittle of God's law and justice in order to be that wise son. And that that righteousness upon completion of his work should be put to the account of sinners such as we are, those that the Father had given him. So it required a wisdom far beyond anything that we could ever even begin to think. In fact, if we begin to think, well, he did a good job, but now I need to come alongside and help make it better or complete it in any sense. That's how a Christ is being preached today as an example. That even as he walks, so we should walk. You've all seen that trend. What would Jesus do? WWJD, people wear it on their wrist. How foolish to think that somehow I'm going to follow that example. No, I need him. I need every aspect of his work in my place as my substitute. And so here, my son be wise and make my heart glad. How do we know that the Lord Jesus Christ made the heart of his father glad? Well, three times when he was on earth, he caused his voice to be heard which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am what? Well pleased. At no point of his life was there ever a disappointment or anything left undone. He had to be that perfect righteousness worked out in his life in order for him to be that perfect sacrifice in his death. When it says there he was made sin for us, he wasn't made sinful. He didn't take on our depravity but he lived out that life to the perfect satisfaction of God the Father. So that in the end, we know that the Father was satisfied because he raised him again from the dead. And he's ascended on high where he's seated. To be seated means that the work is done. Nothing more to add. And so the instruction given to him is forward looking to that time because he was ever with the Father. But when he came in the flesh and humbled himself, that divine stoop, that required of him as a man to live as no other man had ever lived. Even more so than Adam before the fall. Adam before the fall was in an upright state, but he wasn't righteous. Else he would not have fallen. Here the Lord Jesus Christ came as that last Adam to be the substitute, to take on him the, the debt that sinners such as we owe and work out that perfect righteousness. And it says here that I may answer him that reproaches me. That's the Father speaking. When people reproach Christ, they're reproaching the Father. When people speak evil of the work of Christ in whom he saves and whom he doesn't, they're actually attacking him. The Father. And our Lord endured all of these attacks, but 
The father, the only answer he has to give is, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased to hear him. I'm so thankful that that's the case. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, but these wise sayings hidden to the world, if the Lord has granted us eyes to see how they pertain to Christ, then praise him. Because that's the only way we're going to know him, is by revelation, by his spirit. All right.